Chapter 1.3 The Problem of Transubstantiation With those immense political upheavals, the collapse of the Roman Empire, and the sinking of antique civilization, these controversies lapsed likewise into oblivion. But, as in the course of many centuries a certain stability was again reached, psychological differences also reappeared, tentatively at first, but becoming ever more intense with advancing civilization. No longer, indeed, was it those problems which had brought the ancient church into confusion. New forms had come to light, under which, however, the same psychology was concealed. About the middle of the ninth century, the abbot Pascansius Radbertus appeared with a writing upon the Holy Communion, in which he advanced the doctrine of transubstantiation, that is, the view that the wine and holy wafer became transformed in the communion into the actual blood and body of Christ. As is well known, this conception became a dogma, according to which the transformation is accomplished, vere, realiter, substantialiter, in truth, in reality, in substance. Although the accidentals preserve their outer aspect of bread and wine, they are substantially the flesh and the blood of Christ. Against this extreme concretization of a symbol, Retromnus, a monk in the same monastery in which Radbertus was abbot, dared to raise a certain opposition. Radbertus, however, found a more resolute adversary in Scotus Aragina, one of the great philosophers and daring thinkers of the early Middle Ages, who, as Hasse says in his History of the Church, stood so high and solitary above his time that the anathema of the Church reached him only after centuries. As abbot of Malmesbury, he was butchered by his own monks about the year 889. Scotus Aragina, to whom true philosophy was also true religion, was no blind follower of authority, and the once accepted, because, unlike the majority of his age, he could himself think. He set reason above authority, very unseasonably perhaps, but in a way that assured him of the recognition of the later centuries. Even the fathers of the church, who were considered to be above discussion, he held as authorities only in so far as their writings contained treasures of human reason. Thus he also held that the communion is merely a commemoration of that last supper which Jesus celebrated with his disciples, a view in which the reasonable man of every age will, moreover, participate. But Scotus Aragina, although clear and humanly simple in his thoughts, and little disposed to detract from the meaning and value of the sacred ceremony, was not at one with the spirit of his time and the desires of the world around him, a fact that might indeed be inferred from his betrayal and assassination by his own comrades of the cloister. Because he could think reasonably and consistently, success did not come to him. Instead, it fell to Radbertus, who assuredly could not think, but who transubstantiated the symbolical and meaningful, making it coarse and sensuous. In so doing, he clearly chimed in with the spirit of his time, which craved for the concretizing of religious occurrences. Again, in this controversy, one can easily recognize the basic elements which we have already met with in the disputes commented upon earlier, namely the abstract standpoint that is averse from any intercourse with the concrete object and the concretistic that is tuned to the object. Far be it from us to pronounce, from the intellectual viewpoint, a one-sided, depreciatory judgment upon Robertus and his achievement, although to the modern mind this dogma must appear simply absurd, we must not be misled on that account into regarding it as historically worthless. It is indeed a showpiece for every collection of human errors, but its worthlessness is not therefore eo ipsu established. Before passing judgment, we must minutely investigate what this dogma affected in the religious life of those centuries and what our age still indirectly owes to its operation. It must, for instance, not be overlooked that it is precisely the belief in the reality of this miracle that demanded a release of the psychic processes from the purely sensuous, and this cannot remain without influence upon the nature of the psychic process. The process of directed thinking, for instance, becomes absolutely impossible when the sensuous holds too high a threshold value. By virtue of too high a value, it constantly invades the psyche, where it disintegrates and destroys the function of directed thinking, based as this is precisely upon the exclusion of the unsuitable. From this elementary consideration, there immediately follows the practical importance of those rites and dogmas which hold their ground both from this standpoint, 
as well as from a purely opportunist, biological way of thinking, to say nothing of the direct, specific religious impressions which came to individuals from belief in this dogma. Highly as we esteem Scotus Erigena, the less it is permitted to despise the achievement of Radbertus. We may, however, learn from this example that the thought of the introvert is incommensurable with the thought of the extrovert, since the two thought forms, as regards their determinants, are wholly and fundamentally different. One might perhaps say the thinking of the introvert is rational, while that of the extrovert is programmatical. These arguments, and this I wish particularly to emphasize, do not pretend to be in any way decisive with regard to the individual psychology of the two authors. What we know of Scotus Erigena, personally, it is little enough, is not sufficient to enable us to make any sure diagnosis of his type. What we do know speaks in favor of the introversion type. Of Rodbertus we know next to nothing. We know only that he said something that ran counter to common human thought, but with surer feeling logic he divined what his age was prepared to accept as suitable. This fact would speak in favor of the extroversion type. We must, however, through our insufficient knowledge, suspend judgment on both personalities since, especially with Radbertus, the matter might quite well be decided differently. Equally, might he have been an introvert, but with a level of intelligence that altogether failed to rise above the conceptions of his milieu, and with a logic so lacking in originality that it merely sufficed to draw an obvious conclusion from already prepared premises in the writings of the fathers. And vice versa, Scotus Erigena might as well have been an extrovert, if it could be shown that he was carried by a milieu which in any case was distinguished by common sense and which felt a corresponding expression to be suitable and desirable. The latter is in no sort of way proved concerning Scotus Erigena. But on the other hand, we do know how great was the yearning of that time for the reality of the religious miracle. To this character of that age, the view of Scotus Erigena must have seemed cold and deadening, whilst the assertion of Redbertus must have been alive with a sense of promise, since it concretized what every man desired. End of section 5. Recording by Olivia.